Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Sling the Biscuit. This is going to be episode four of season four. It has taken us nine takes to get this show going and off the ground. My name is Travis Ridgen. I am an unemployed professional hockey player currently looking for work, but I do this podcast on the side. I am in Edmonton here at the downtown Edmonton studio for the Nation Network, the home of Oilers Nation and their incredible portfolio shows. My co-host is good looking and somewhere in the state of New York, I think Buffalo, Rob Lelon. How are you, my friend? What's up, everybody? Slang in the Biscuit. Great to be back with you, episode four. I know a lot of you guys are looking for Winnipeg's number one morning radio host, but you got me, so I'm ready to go. Let's go, Trev. You, do you have a morning show by chance or no? Uh, not yet, but uh, you know we're working on it. You never know. Hanging out with you long enough, you, know, you never know where you might end up. Speaking of which, I did want to say thank you so much to the incredible listeners of the show. Last uh, The last episode did just short of 10,000 listens. So between the audio and the video platforms, thank you so much. Because the listeners who watch this show... You literally make this possible. So thank you so much for your support uh, between Rob and I, and uh, we're excited for an incredible episode today. But on that note, and speaking of uh, radio show hosts and top morning shows, there was a specific co-host that I used to have on this show who was very against the idea of me getting a tattoo. Specifically, I wanted to get the text of Winnipeg, the city of Winnipeg where I'm born and raised, tattooed on my neck right here. Just a little thing, because I'll never live in the, the city of Winnipeg ever again, but I'm very patriotically Winnipeg. I want to get that tattooed. He told me, don't do it. Because if you're ever in an orange jumpsuit in court, you don't want that visible. My co-host has quite a lot of tattoos now. I'm curious. Rob, what do you think of that idea? Do you think we should do that sometime So soon? you're telling me your first tattoo idea is going to be to tattoo on your neck? Why, why, what's, what's your thought behind that? Like, What are you thinking? So my thought process is whether I'm on the ice or I'm walking on the seawall in Vancouver, you can see my neck. And if this is like a little text right here that says Winnipeg, you know that I'm from Winnipeg. I'm branded as Winnipeg. And I'll never live there again, but my mom lives there. It's where I'm born and raised. I'm very passionately Winnipeg. And it's not like something stupid where I'm getting like a lion or like a potato gun on my neck. I'm getting like the city that I was born in, like very small, like a little text like that. I, th I thought it was a cool idea. I've been sitting on it for about six months. I've heard sit on it for a year. But I don't, I don't know how I feel. Yeah. I feel like you're the one to ask. I mean, I, I like the idea of sitting on it for a little longer. Uh, somebody myself who definitely, yeah, I have tattoos. And uh, I'm actually in this stage of my life glad that I never got a neck tattoo. Uh, or, to be honest with you, glad I never got hand tattoos. But that's not to say, uh, you know, if you you know feel like it's something that you want to do, that go ahead and try it out and get a tattoo. But um, maybe not your first one to get it on the neck, especially if you've only been thinking about it for six months. Especially since I remember you and I talked about this a couple years ago and you weren't really into the idea of tattoos at all, and now all of a sudden you kind of change your tune. Yeah, I hate tattoos, but I, I like the idea of just Whoa. putting Winnipeg on my neck. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I hate tattoos, but you think in a neck tattoo with Winnipeg? And you're, Are you that loyal to Winnipeg too, or what? I am passionately, I'm the most passionate Winnipegger of all time. I put myself up there. I mean, yeah. I, like I said, Trav, it's, it's all you, man. Uh, if you want to get a tattoo, if you want to go with the neck, uh, you're definitely putting a statement out there. But especially you, man, somebody who's making videos and putting content out. Uh, you're going to be seeing that tattoo a lot, you know what I'm saying, and everything that you do. Uh, whereas if you get a tattoo somewhere else on your body, you can hide it sometimes and you might get tired of it. You know what I mean? It's hard to, it's hard to say, but why don't you try uh, maybe go with like a headed tattoo and see how that plays and see if you like it. I think my big concern is that I get the tattoo on now at 27 and by the time I'm like 63, it'll get all wrinkly. Instead of saying Winnipeg, it'll say Regina. It'll be like, ugh, gross. Like I don't yeah. want it to deteriorate like that. You know, like Regina, Saskatchewan, the, uh, yeah. the province that rhymes with fun. So you're, you're already thinking in the future, and that's good, uh, for sure. But uh, you know what, man? Like, another thing that you don't realize, like, I learned this about when you get a tattoo, is that, like, people are going to, un you're going to get unwanted comments from people, whether positive or negative. So you're going to get that tattoo, and all of a sudden, it's going to create a whole new talk track for you in your life. So you're going to be going around, whether you're in Winnipeg or wherever you're traveling in the world, people are going to come up to you and start talking to you about your tattoo, because they're going to see it. And it's something that you don't realize like when you do it, that that's going to happen later on in your life. So just think about that before you put something permanent. That's what I mean. Like I wouldn't even be opposed, like try out, try out a henna and just see the, see the way people look at you and see if you like the way uh, it changes your life a little bit. And then, then maybe do permanent. I can see people definitely having their opinions. Go on for it. it. Maybe, maybe uh, while you mix it in, while, while you're there, just get maybe a face tat. You know what I mean? Like right <laughs> under your left eye. <laughs> like uh, Jacoby from Papa Roach. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? If you're going to do that, you might as well get the bridge, you know, the Winnipeg Bridge right across your forehead. <laughs> get the Arlington Bridge right on my forehead. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> hey, you can get the uh, Key Bank Center in uh, Buffalo on your forehead, too. We can do matching tattoos. What do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty glad I didn't do that, man, back in my, uh, <laughs> in my wild days, getting uh, any sort of uh, tattoos on my neck or, you know, stuff like that. Face tattoos. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't do that, bro. 
Well, the comment section, please. Uh, there's lots of comments. Yeah, at should least. Trav, let, let me should know. Should Trav get one? Let's let's have let's do a vote in the comments. Like, should Trav get the face or the neck tat? What would you do? Let us know in the comments. <laughs> um, I did want to say though, I, I have a trip back, booked back to Winnipeg for uh, I think in three weeks from now. Taking the train from Vancouver to Winnipeg. I'm gonna go see my mom for a couple of days, miss her, and uh, see you home. But uh, I'm also awesome. Yeah, well, you met my mom. My mom is awesome. Like I'm a mama's boy, and I'm a, I'm a through and through mom lover. Yeah, your mom's a beauty. She's a big supporter. Number, number one fan, for sure. Um, I'm also doing a, a trip to uh, uh, Vail, Colorado, just outside of Denver, for playing for a senior team there. In uh, Yeti, oh, I, I don't want to screw it up. For, for uh, Vail and Yeti, uh, senior team, Daniel Amesbury played for them a couple weeks ago, but they're flying me out uh, from Winnipeg to Denver to go play for them, and then they're sending me back to Vancouver. Um, so it's going to be a two-game trip, so a Friday, Saturday start, I believe March 1st and 2nd. So if you're in the area, come on out. We'd love to uh, see you because that's going to be a really, really fun weekend skiing out uh, in the mountains in Denver, seeing the Rocky Mountains, playing some hockey, and uh, doing some travel as well. It's all going to be really, really awesome and really excited for it. But I did want to ask you, because I remember this past summer when you and I were in Halifax together, we took the train from uh, Halifax to Montreal, and that was uh, or to Toronto, actually, and that was a, a nightmare of trips. It, it, um, it, if there was something that could have gone wrong, that definitely could have been it. I want to see now if I can pitch you on taking the Rocky Mountain train, taking the Canadian from Vancouver to Winnipeg. Are you open to this idea? I mean, I'm always open to new experiences, man. I know you mentioned uh, the Halifax trip. That was uh, a tough grind at the time, but you know, we had fun, man. It was a good. That was a good experience, all things considered. You know, doing that overnight trip and uh, getting stuck in the middle of nowhere and just sitting around on the train. But uh, I'd be down for it. I'd be open to it. Are you definitely sold on taking the train as opposed to just flying it? Oh, I, I love the train. Well, actually, I have some points to use. So I have points for this trip, and then I have points for another trip, and then I've used them all up. So I figured I might as well use them. I got my aeroplane points, I got my via points, I got all these points left, right, and center. So I might as well use them. But the thing that I love the most about taking the train across Canada is compared specifically in the Toronto to Vancouver portion compared to the Halifax Montreal portion, we're talking nice meals, like three course dinners, soup, salad, starter, good entrees, Alberta prime rib with the beef, the rack of lamb, the roast chicken, you get dessert, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Like it's, it's incredible. You get these <laughs> awesome, really comfortable cabins and sleepers that we didn't get on the, uh, the European style train going from Halifax to Montreal and the views, the Canadian Rocky Mountains. I would say Canada's got to have some of the best scenery on the planet with the Rocky Mountains once you pass Canmore and uh, I believe Hinton, on the more northern route, you head through Jasper National Park, through Banff, just the Rocky Mountains are just something to be uh, to be marveled at. I, I'm just so fascinated by them. You're bringing me back to the vlog that you did uh, a couple of years ago. Was it a couple of years ago now when you did the train vlog, the V yeah, rail? It was, it was last year. I remember you Facetime me. You watched the video. You're like, oh dude, yeah, that's one of my favorite Trav training. videos. Oh yeah, listen to Trav des- describe his dinners and his uh, dessert portions from the train rides. It's worth the uh, it's, yeah, it's worth the view for sure. Warm oh, apple crisp a la mode with cold vanilla ice cream. Does it get any better? Or brownie there a la mode too. Brownies are great too. There it is. Does it get any, ladies and gentlemen, does it get any better than this? Like, that's a, <laughs> classic Trav. <laughs> I mean, short of getting a job in the hockey market, I don't know how it gets any better for me at this point in time with some uh, hot apple crisp and ice cream. Yeah, so you're going to work out a deal with the uh, the rail line or what? Like, how does the trip to go from Vancouver straight to Colorado? Uh, no, so I'm flying from Winnipeg to Colorado and then flying Colorado back to Vancouver, but I'm taking the train from Vancouver to Winnipeg to go see my mom. So train, Oh, so that's, one of, that's a route that you're familiar with. You know that. Oh, I think this will be my 10th time in the Canadian going that uh, that route. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Let's hope to see I'm, another one of those travel vlogs from you. I'm a seasoned vet, man. I could take that trip 10 times and still turn it out and do a video. But speaking of uh, in the hockey realm, I did want to talk about this from uh, last week's episode the week before was uh, the opportunity that I found in Russia. Well, first off, what do you think, Rob, about that whole opportunity before I get into addressing some of the comments on it? Uh, the one, the one, the the Russian opportunity you had to go over and play where they were going to fly you over and pay for... Yeah, to go play in the tournament for 10 days. I think it sounds like a really fun time, man. I think we talked about it before where, was, you know, obviously it's a tricky time, right? With, uh, you know, the situation going on in Russia and Ukraine and like, you know, traveling to that part of the world would be obviously, uh, you know, a pretty intense situation. But... You know, for you as a hockey player, you have an opportunity to, you know, go get paid to play hockey. That's what you do. You got to, you know, take options and take advantage of every option that comes your way. And that's something that I definitely think you should you, can, you should consider. You know what I'm saying? Even though there's obviously some risks that come with it. And I know a lot of people were saying that they weren't, you know, it's like you're supporting Russia or you're anti-Ukraine or you're taking sides in some conflict where I don't I don't know if I would look at it if I like that if I was you. I think the way that people need to look at it, if you're a viewer of the show, is... I am a hockey player who is currently unemployed at the moment. My agent found an opportunity to go play in Russia for a 10-day tournament to make some money 
and to continue playing the hockey season even for two weeks. And I said, okay, do you think this is a safe, good op- option? He said, yep, okay. I reached out to a couple guys who were playing over there. Yep, same thing. They all agreed. Okay, I looked online. The tournament looked legitimate. I did a little more research online. Okay, seems like this is all-encompassing. As long as I don't do something stupid to get locked up in the gulag, it should be an all-encompassing great trip and a great time to go play hockey, realistically speaking. For anybody listening to the show that thinks I'm going to go fly there and I'm going to wear a country's flag and go on the front lines, you are sadly mistaken. I'm not doing this for a political stance. I'm going to go play hockey and leave. I'm going to go in, play hockey, make some money, bounce. See you later. Simple as that. And anyone that sees it differently, like, I don't mean to be rude. There's so many things going on in the world that, that I don't fully understand, that you don't fully understand, that we all don't fully understand. So, like, why? Let, let's just let those things be and let's just focus on the good. I, I found an opportunity to play hockey. It seemed great until we realized that my passport was about to expire in three months and you need a six-month buffer to go into Russia. I said, okay, guys, can you give me a couple days? My agent informed them of that. I went, I found out that you can get a passport in a day, two days max. I said, hey, listen, I'm going to go do the paperwork today. I'm going to get the passport applied for. I'm going to get it for you. Can we still do this? They said, we moved on. We we just took you off the list. We applied for a visa for somebody else. We needed to get this moving sooner than later. So that is my own fault for not being up to date and on top of my passport. It's unfortunate it didn't work out. But instead, I get to go to Colorado. I get to go skate in Vail and play a couple games of senior hockey. And I get to go play in some other tournaments and try to win some nice cash prizes on top of it. So things are... Looking nice. I would also like to say mindset. Okay, I've talked a lot about mindset, about who you are as a person in the last couple months. As somebody who says that I love goaltending and I want to continue playing hockey, you can't say that if an option comes from my agent. He says, okay, here's his opportunity. Is it safe? Yep, checks out. Reach out. Everything looks good. And then I say, well, no, I don't feel like, like I can't genuinely say I'm committed to fulfilling this, this goal of finishing the season if I'm not willing to take an opportunity like this. Like, I feel like that's very, very, very straightforward. And on top of that as well, like, my entire journey through professional hockey and through everything I've been doing the past couple of years, I've documented it in the moment, right? So when I talk about, I'm going to go and accomplish this, I'm going to go do this, and I have a certain mindset towards things about accomplishing things, and regardless of how I feel, there's certain things that need to be done. It's not like I accomplish it, and then at the end, I'm like, I give you a big rah-rah speech. It's, this is my mindset going through this. I want to play the rest of the season. Opportunity comes. I say yes. We try to pursue it. And if it doesn't work out, so be it. Right? Like, is that not the mindset to have, Rob? Yeah, you going over to Russia is not taking a political stance one way or the other. It's an opportunity, could have been anywhere. You know, as a hockey player yourself, especially a guy like you, you're grinding, you're looking for a spot to play. You can't, you're not in a position, in my opinion, to say, oh, I'm not going to go here, not going to go there because of the political climate. Because, you know what I mean? That's, you're not a politician, you're a hockey player. You know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of great people from all over the world. So I think for you, I would take a look at every opportunity. And if this rush opportunity, you and your agent think that that's a good thing for you guys, then I don't, I wouldn't cross it off the list just because of the, 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 the geopolitical uh, aspect ratio of it. Yeah. If you look back to like April of uh, 2020, when people were saying, don't go to Sweden, don't go do that. Like, let's look back now. How did that pan out? Right. So like you never really truly know what's going on, but um, although I'm not a politician and I'm currently an unemployed professional hockey player, you know what I am? I am a doctor who knows what a good pair of underwear looks like. I know what it looks like, and I know what it feels like, and it starts with the team at Sheath Underwear, the presenting sponsor for the show. They've been with us since day one, since its inception of the show, and they still are here today. So Sheath Underwear, you have to get a pair for two simple reasons. One, they have this incredible bamboo mesh technology that is cooling and is comfortable. Now, the real selling point is the dual pouch. Now, the dual pouch is a separated, segregated compartment for your dick and your balls to put them into so that you're not sticking to the side of your leg. They're not stuck together. You're not bat winging. So if you're on the construction site, you can be comfortable all day while you're working. If you're in an office, like this incredible studio at the Nation Network, you can work here all day, be comfortable. If you are flying overseas to go play in a Russian hockey tournament, you're good to go. Or if you're doing butt ends demos for Johnny Quick and the LA Kings and or Vegas Golden Knights and or New York Rangers, you can stay calm, cool, and collected as well. And you go to sheathunder.com. There's a link in the video description on the video version of the show. There's also a link in these, the podcast notes for Apple and Spotify, the code BISCUIT. 69 B-I-Z-K-I-T-69 will get you 20% off the greatest pair of underwear money has ever bought on the face of this planet, only from the team of Sheath. Yep, and you better believe I'd be rocking Sheath when uh, we're doing butt ends demos for all the boys, so. <laughs> <laughs> One question I did have for you, and this was in the notes, um, Johnny Quick, so he just went back to LA, they did a really, really nice uh, ceremony, nice little tribute yeah, to him after everything he did. It was really, really nice. You got to play with him, like what was that like? 
Man, I, I always get this question, man. People have been asking me for a long time about what it was like playing with Jonathan Quick. And I, honestly, well, it's, it's almost obvious. He's the best goalie I've ever been on the ice with. And we all knew that at the time. I remember he, rookie, uh, Quickie came in his rookie year. I was uh, playing in Reading uh, for the Reading Royals in the East Coast Hockey League. He was drafted. He was L.A. property. Um, and he was working with Billy Ranford at the time um, as like a special goalie coach. And I don't know if he was like the guy that they thought was going to be their you know best goalie of all time. But he was definitely somebody that they invested in. Um, and I remember he was in Reading. And right away he came in and made us like one of the best teams in the league. And honestly, Quickie, uh, he was one of the best guys too. Like he was just instantly one of the boys. And uh, it was it, uh, playing with him, having Jonathan Quick like in the net gave us a chance every night where we were like, man, we, we can't lose with this guy. And like everybody knew, like just watching him play, that he was going to be something special. And I remember a lot of times like Billy Ranford would come in from LA and just come down to Reading and work with Quickie. And like he, I would, Quickie, he and I were like boys. So I would always take the opportunity every chance I could to get on the ice with him. So like, you know, Billy Ranford would come over and he'd need shooters. And I was always one of the guys who wanted to get out there and shoot. He'd have like three or four guys. And uh, just to see the work ethic that he had, even as a rookie, uh, you could tell he was going to be something special. And one, one story about Quickie that I always loved was like that it never happened for me. Like I never saw this as a player was, you know how, and you know, Trav, in warmups, when, uh, you know, the players start shooting pucks, they come in and they funnel down toward the net and the goalie might get in there, take like two or three and then get out of the way so that all the players can just like pepper the net. Quickie was the one goalie I've ever played with who, he, when, when other goalies would leave the net, Quickie would jump into the net. So like every single player from the team was coming down the, straight down the middle with a puck. Quickie would get in there and he would be literally getting hit with like four and five pucks at a time, but he'd be like making saves. He'd be making saves with his head. Like he was just a goalie that just loved to eat pucks. And um, it, it was, it's been really fun to watch him just have the success that he's had and to see what he's, you know, become one of the best goalies. If not, now I guess you got to say he's the best American goalie of all time, uh, even just on numbers alone. So I don't know. That's, uh, what do you think? Hands down, man. He's one of the greatest of all times. He, he was one of my favorites in the early 2010s, leading the Kings to the cup final, um, with the victory against the Devils, against the Rangers, that shutout in game three, three nothing to put the Rangers down three games to none in his home state. Um, against the Rangers in the Cup final, that was incredible. The the whole performance, start to finish, when they um, when they almost swept the Canucks, they swept the Blues, they swept the Coyotes, they beat the Devils in the Cup final. Like that, those were some incredible years of watching Jonathan Quick. And obviously, things have changed now. Where you know, he's on the tail end of his career, he's not as flexible, not as violent, not as aggressive and agile as he used to be. But he's still one of the greatest to ever play as a goaltender. Definitely the greatest American goalie of all time, and you can't take that away from him. But he's still, I mean, even this year, though, having a bounce-back year, playing for his hometown. Uh, you know, when he was a kid, he was a big Ranger fan, so he goes and plays in, in, in plays for New York now, and, like, I've seen him play a couple games where he looks like the old Quickie. I mean, he's, like, back to being, like, Quickie in his prime. And, uh, you know, he's a guy I would never bet against Quickie, man. I love I love that guy. He was so fun to play with, uh, and just it's so cool to see him have success, and, and obviously now even have more success again this season, too. Well, I remember in the mid-2010s, and they would do like player polls, like what goalie do you want in net for game seven overtime? They all picked quick because when it came down to crunch oh, time, yeah. like he was clutch. Like game seven overtime versus Chicago gets it done. Uh, down so three nothing clutch. against the Sharks gets it done. Uh, the cup finals gets it done. He's one of those goalies and, and play like one of those kind of players. Like there's a, you know, a couple guys in the league that you would literally pay just to go see them play. Like Dominic Hasek was a goalie. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Like he was a, he was a guy that like you would just go to see Dominic Hasek. And I think Quickie fit this, is right in that category where he was the kind of player where you'd go just to watch him play because he was so exciting. He made the game more exciting to see. He absolutely did. Like I watched so many games as a kid in high school and then even coming out of high school, like watching him in the cup finals. Like I was glued to the TV watching because he was so exciting. And like you said, he is that one guy where like I would go to see the Kings play in Winnipeg against the Jets. I went to go see Quickie play. I didn't, go to, I didn't care about the Kings. I didn't care about the Jets. There was no hellebuck at the time. I went to go see Quickie. Yeah, man, it was cool. I remember Quickie was, he, one time we were in the coast, he's playing in the East Coast, he gets called up to the American League, and uh, for whatever reason, I think he had like a, I think a 50 safe shutout, and uh, I, I can't remember the exact story, but like something, something happened where like he missed his alarm and overslept and got sent back down to the coast as like, you know, basically like, man, this is not how we do it. You got like, Quickie was sick, but we got to get this guy disciplined. So he gets sent back to Reading. And I remember the reunion we had, we were with like hanging out after practice, like me and a couple of the boys. And Quickie came in after being up in the American League and having success back to the coast, which we never thought we'd see him again when he got there. He comes back in, we walks in the room, and everyone's like, Quickie. And it was just like, whoa, and like all the boys come running up, giving him a big hug. And it was, you know, great for us that he was back playing in the coast and playing for Reading. 
but uh, obviously the goal was to get to the next level and get to the American League. And uh, uh, it, the worst part for us was that we made it to the playoffs that year. And uh, right at the end of the season, the Kings said, no, no, he's going up to play in Manchester and eventually on to L.A. So we lost Quickie, like right before playoffs. And uh, that was it, man. We didn't really have the what it took to make a run that year. You bounced in the first round? Uh, that year, no. We lost in the second round, I think, that year. We had a big playoff win that, uh, that first round against Elmira. Uh, game six overtime win to, go on, to move on to play in the second round. We lost to the eventual champion Cincinnati Cyclones, which if we had had Quickie, uh, we were the favorite, I think, for sure. That reminds me of a good Fed story. We'll save that for later. But I did want to mention, I know Quickie's getting to the end of his career and on the topic of retirement, uh, Daniel Diamond Hands Amesbury, him and uh, AJ Galante do that amazing tra- Talk and Trash podcast. Uh, every week they did a great episode this past Sunday as well, talking about uh, Diamond Hands' lifetime ban from the uh, FPHL. And to quote Will Arnett in Blades of Glory, lifetime ban. That's a long time. Yeah. But I have, <laughs> that's a long time. <laughs> it's no good. We can, com- we can compete in pair skating, not singles. It's never been done before, Jimmy. <laughs> Jazz Michael Michael skates alone. <laughs> Um, I have obtained, <laughs> sorry, it's totally going off the topics, off the rails here. I obtained, obtained exclusive video on Diamond Hands' retirement speech to the boys and for the Danbury Hattricks in the locker room. They canned him. He came in and said, boys, i got a few words to say. Take a listen. I fight for my team. They need me to bleed. Then I bleed. I started my career here in St. John's. I think it's only fitting that I, uh... I'm winding it up here. I still got some fighting me left. What do you say, boys? Let's go to the playoffs. Give the old man one last shot at the ring. I'll vote it, eh? God bless Newfoundland. What a speech. What a speech by the boss. Ross the Boss Ray. You've seen Goon before, right? Yeah, of course. Classic. But I think I think Goon's got to be the best hockey movie of all time. No doubt about it. Sean William Scott playing Doug the Thug Glatt. I don't remember who plays Ross the Boss Ray. I can't remember the character's name. But most of the video, the movie was filmed actually in Winnipeg. And as a matter of fact, here's a, uh, not to spoil everything for you, like this uh, brick wall we have behind us. It isn't really a brick wall. Oops. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's wallpaper, by the way. It looks pretty good, though, doesn't it? I don't mean to spoil yeah, you everything never know. Here. You'd, you'd never know. Um, the opening shot of uh, Goon is uh, downtown Montreal, or at least they're trying to pass it off as, but it's actually the Arlington Bridge in the city of Winnipeg. They closed that bridge down for two days in 2010, I believe it was, might have been 2011, and they closed it down for two days to put a camera on a rolling dolly and roll it over the bridge to sunrise, and they tried to pass it off as downtown Montreal. It's not. It's a scam. By the way, that Arlington Bridge is now out of commission and might potentially be tattooed on my forehead because Rob yeah, told me to. Say, there, there's a perfect idea for your tat. Everything's tying in together for this episode. The goon, the tattoos, the city of Winnipeg, the thug, Johnny Quick, Diamond Hands' retirement speech. Everything is flowing well today. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Keep it going. <laughs> do you remember, um, so they, they did a lot of the stuff in Halifax, for the Halifax Highlanders and goon. But we were in Halifax this summer. Our love of Donair, do you remember when I told us we were going to, or when I decided, I guess, for us collectively, that we were going to skimp out on lobster and, and just go crush a couple more Donairs? Remember that? Yeah, I, honestly, uh, it was my first experience with Donair because, uh, I mean, we had Doner Kebab, but never, I think, is Donair, uh, is that like a Halifax tradition or is that something specific to Halifax? Yeah, it's specific to Halifax. It's basically kebab or shawarma, I guess if you want to call it that, but with the, the Halifax sauce, it's a sweet sauce with sweetened condensed milk, uh, onion powder, garlic powder, and garlic. Chef Trav yeah, knows the full garlic. recipe. Look at this. I remember you convinced me, you convinced me for Donair and I I was pushing against it because I was like, I don't know, man. And you were like, come on, we got to do this. So we went and smashed a few Donairs. It was pretty good. (laughs) I don't want to eat poor people for me. I'm better than this. It's like, uh, it's like, I was going to say, it's like Trav when he drinks Perrier. Yeah. Like when I drink Perrier water, I think I'm better than everybody else in the room. But the second that bottle is empty, I go back to realizing, oh, I'm just a piece of shit. I'm a terrible scumbag human being now that the Perrier is empty. But same thing with uh, Donair. Oh, easy, man. don't have such negative self-talk, bro. But the the don- donair was awesome. Right? <laughs> Sweet meat. Yeah, we had that. Uh, we had that great donair right out. Uh, we were on the ledge. Remember that? We P- had, uh, pizza corner. Bunch, pizza corner. Yeah, right in the middle of Halifax. That was a great, uh, great experience. Bunch of people uh, recognized you. Came up, said what's up. Big fans of the vlog. Yeah, I had, like donair sauce all over my face. Like, hey, you're traveling. Like, yes. He's drip dripping donair sauce down off of his elbow onto the sidewalk. 
<laughs> I'm trying to film a, a piece for the vlog talking about doing air. This guy's asking me, hey man, I've seen your videos before. I'm trying to like mop the sauce off my face, my shirt, my pants for wearing three quarters of it. What a time to be in downtown Halifax. I was just sitting there eating my donair, watching the whole thing, watching how Trev handled it. <laughs> like, man, this guy's girlfriend doesn't let him out of the house when he acts like this. I'll bet. Oh, we can see that. We can see why. <laughs> she gone. So who cares? Like uh, when, um, <laughs> uh, when, when the province of Quebec was trying to leave Canada and the Newfies were like, get them out of there, bud. Get them out of there. Be a shorter drive to Toronto. Get them out. And he's gone. Um, I did want to do a little, little bit of a Fed talk, though. You mentioned Elmira. And the Elmira enforcers from a couple of years ago, I think, perfectly embody everything the Fed is about. Now, the FPHL, the Fed, the my former employer, I guess, for a couple multiple teams, uh, six teams, four games in the last two years. How are you? Um, the Elmira enforcers, the owner made himself the team logo. I'm not making this up, by the way, Rob. The I kind of like his, that, actually. <laughs> he took his face. They said, I don't know what to call ourselves. We could be the Mammoth, the Jackals, the River Sharks. No, Enforcers. What's our logo? Me. Put his face on the cover of the jerseys. I actually don't mind that. If that's the Elmira team? The Elmira, yeah, the Elmira Is, is Elmira, are they only in the Fed now? They're not in the coast anymore? Uh, I think they have a triple A team, like a prep academy too, but just the uh, just the Fed. They were the Elmira Enforcer. Sorry, they were the Elmira Jackals, the Elmira Enforcers, the Elmira Mammoth. And now they're the River Sharks. Yeah, I like played every- in Elmira when they were the Jackals, and that was always a that was a tough barn to go into, man. Like you said, they always had a really tough team. I got in a bunch of fights in that arena. First, I think are, first what, arena is what it's called. They whenever they had the broadcast going on in Elmira, it's always so empty in there, and I think just like what a shame because just going off what you've told me because I've never been to Elmira before. Seems like there's a lot of potential for success there, but yeah, um, it was always a pretty. I, I always remembered it being a pretty good crowd uh, when we played there, and uh, we had a couple battles. We were down the street in Reading, so it was like kind of a basically a local a local rivalry that it turned into. And we had that big playoff series against Elmira, but they always had a bunch of tough guys. It was a tough place to go in and play. The Fed, though, you've seen the movie Semi Pro, right? I know we talk about Blades of Glory, but you know Semi Pro, Will Ferrell, yeah, right, like Jackie Moon, like Love Me Sexy. Right? I can't quote it like you, but. There's a lot of movies I can quote, but Semi Pro is definitely one of them. I think though the FPHL, if you take the movie the movie Semi Pro with Will Ferrell and you swap the basketballs out for pucks, you basically get the FPHL. Like when uh, Dukes hits the the half court shot for ten thousand dollars, who's going to pay him? Oh, the beer company will pay him. They're not really a sponsor. That's the Fed. Uh, free corn dogs. We'll do all these different promotional nights. Like uh, Motor City was actually doing one dollar hot dog night the other day, and I don't know how they did that because they don't. They don't have any affiliation to the actual like concession in the arena. They just rent out the arena. So I don't know where they were selling hot dogs. And also, I don't know where they were buying hot dogs for a dollar a piece and making money on them. But hey, whatever it takes to bring people to the game, I suppose. And as far as the uh, the actual like legality of the league, like the Fed is a non for profit. Right? Like it's like the income you make playing the Fed is not taxable. So when I go over there to play in Motor City or Watertown or Mississippi, nobody's on a visa. Everybody's just coming in as like a visitor. And after, I think, 90 days or 180 days, whatever, if you're overstaying, you're, you're welcome. You just leave and then come back. And then you get paid in cash or these uh, checks that you had the final way to deposit last year in Motor City or this year with these prepaid Visa gift cards. So they give you a Visa gift card. They load money onto it. And like I said, when I went from Watertown to Motor City, I was gen- or Watertown to Mississippi, I was genuinely concerned they were going to drain the account because I'm like, oh. Honestly, at this point, wouldn't surprise me. They're not going to pay me for jerseys, so who knows if they're going to take the money out of my account. But like, that's essentially how the Fed works, right? Like, literally semi-pro, Jackie Moon style, with hockey pucks. Do you have? Do you know any players that have like come out of the Fed and like t- t- taken their experience in the Fed and like moved up the ranks to play at a high level? Like, are there anybody? There's that you a know? couple guys that have played in the American League. I know Dylan Kelly. Uh, he played. He through. started in the Fed, and he started in the Fed, and ended up playing in the American League, and then. Maybe yeah, Dylan, Dylan Kelly's not a full-timer in the American League. He went from Danbury and the Hattricks and the Elmira Enforcers to, um, was it Birmingham? No, it wasn't Birmingham. It was Evansville. No, sorry, the Macon Mayhem in the SPHL called up to the East Coast and then called up to the American League for one game, got his win, then got sent back down, and now he's a full-timer with the Casey Mavericks. Um, there's a there's a couple guys, probably like, I want to say like 10 or 12 guys that have probably gone from the Fed to the East Coast, but nobody's gone all the way. Well, there's got so for you, right, like you're playing in the Fed, you're getting the experience, you're getting your YouTube channel right like you're doing partially for promotion right like but for guys that don't have a youtube channel like and you were there like how are those guys surviving with you know very little money and like checks they can't cash and visa gift cards (laughs) living with nine guys like how are most of these guys like surviving day to day man i've heard of guys that have told me hey i just got offered a call up 
but our team hasn't paid me. I don't have money to get down there. The team that I'm getting called up to won't spot me any money, so I can't take this call up because I need to get paid. And then maybe even the team might even go like two more weeks without paying, and then they go home because they have no money. Like stuff like that happens all the time. But as far as guys doing jobs, like I've never heard of any guys in the Fed working a job during the season. A lot of guys will work jobs in the summer, put aside some money, and then come play during the season. I would say a good, eh, like 30% to my knowledge, at least in what I've played with. Um, they're coming out of college and their parents support them, which hey, that works for you. Great. Uh, as a, well, yeah, actually when I was a pro player, I would bartend in the summer times. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I was, a you know, I was doing the same thing, man. I had to earn money cause like I was playing in the East coast and we weren't making a fortune. No one's getting rich playing in the minors. So, uh, in the summertime I was working as a bartender. Um, and it was good, lucrative money. Like I was making good money and it was a lot of fun. Uh, but it's tough to, you know, when you're playing pro hockey, you're competing to get to the next level. Like it's, it's tough when you're spending your nights in the summertime, working until 4 a.m., you know, serving drinks and like being around that bar scene. So it's a challenge for sure. You know what I'm saying? Um, you really want to be, devo- you know, devoting most of your energy and most of your time to your craft. But, you know, I was, a you know, somebody who had to go and, and earn money as well. So I, I bartended uh, as a pro. Um, and then when I was playing junior hockey before that, like I was also supporting myself by, uh, I worked at Papa Gino's. Uh, I remember that at the grill, I was a grill man at Papa Gino's. Um, so that way I could earn, earn some money as well when I wasn't playing hockey. You were slinging steaks in the Barbie, right? Yeah. I was the grill man at Papa Gino's did cheese steaks, pasta, salads. Uh, it was a pretty fun job. I actually really enjoyed it. My, uh, the guy I worked with was my roommate, Jimmy Pellegrino. He and I are still, uh, good boys. And, uh, we do hockey camp in the summer together and we always joke around about our time spent like, you know, in the morning working the lunch rush at Papa Gino's and then packing it all up and heading to practice in the afternoon down in Saugus Mass to play junior hockey. So sometimes you got to pay, pay your dues. Someone was asking me the other day, what jobs did I work uh, like while playing junior hockey or college hockey? When I was playing junior hockey, I had just, uh, I was living on my own for the first time. I was like 19, 20, 21 in that, in that time frame, And I would like work full time, like six to two or like seven to three as like a breakfast cook. And then go home, maybe have a quick nap, maybe make food, and then go play junior hockey. I did that for two years. And then the last year, um, I worked as a baker as well. So the, uh, the culinary school I did coming out of high school, because in, in Winnipeg, for high school, instead of doing electives, you could do like a trade school for six months. So yeah. I did a culinary school, trade school. And then I worked in kitchens and then worked in bakeries. So I, uh, I feel pretty confident being able to cook yeah. and bake anything you want. I remember when I first met you, and I, you, were, you were telling me about your baking and your souffles. And I was like, what? Like, this is uh, it's kind of intriguing. It definitely comes in handy on date night. Like if you meet a girl a couple of dates in, like, what do you want for dinner? I don't know. What do you want? All right, sit so down. I'll, I'll put the steak in on the on the pan. I'll throw it in the oven. We'll get the gross garlic mashed potatoes going. The cheesecake is just settling in the fridge. Plain cheesecake, by the way. We don't do any sauce or anything. In the uh, the Bernays sauce for the steak. I'll just whip that up right now. Hollandaise, like a little bit of uh, hair going in that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Okay. But uh, honestly, you, you, you hit a point here too, man. Like just from an athletic point of view, like if you're a young player, like learning how to cook your own meals is a very valuable asset you can have, especially when you get into the pro ranks. So you're not stuck eating like Subway. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like eating garbage food. Like learning how to cook your own meals is a very, uh, that's an important thing for a hockey player. If you're going to go on the grind and go off into the world, like you need to be able to like treat, you know, feed yourself with nutritional food and learn how to cook it yourself. It definitely will help you. I think I know what people should feed themselves with. And it's the untold stories from my FPHL days. It's on Patreon right now for five bucks a month if you join the show or join the page on Patreon. What a transition, right? Five bucks a month. You can get uh, my trading cards in Motor City. Uh, Varberg, uh, Sweden, Flemingsburg, college, junior. You get some merch, uh, sweaters, hats, all that good stuff. My uh, six games, four teams, or what time was it in Withville? 12 pass, Ridgen, mugs. Those are all different price points as well on the Patreon. But for five bucks, you get the exclusive untold stories. Satisfy your hunger. Join the Patreon page today. There's a link in the video description. You'll love it. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I talked last week about the, the native tournament. Um, this is kind of some sad news. So um, the native tournament this weekend was supposed to be uh, up from Edmonton to Fort McMurray over the ice roads into uh, Lake Chippewa. Uh, unfortunately, the tournament was canceled. This is really sad and really tragic. There was a, a massive plane crash just outside of the reserve, uh, I believe on Thursday night. It might have been Friday, Friday morning. Um, six people died, 11 people injured in this plane crash. Um, obviously, like the reserve was, was hit by this because it's right beside the reserve. And uh, they canceled the whole tournament. So that's... Yeah, rest in peace. Like that's awful. Like six people dying and oh man, crash. yeah. I saw that article and unfortunately, I was looking through it. I didn't see like it didn't really show like what happened or was it like you know 
uh, an error of the pilot or did the plane, like the, the engine die in the mid flight? Like, I don't really know exactly what happened. Like you don't hear that often about planes crashing. It's kind of, f- kind of frightening. I, f- I feel like they hold on to that information, like from the black box and everything until they have, have a full report. Like, they don't tell you that right away. I do know for myself personally this summer, um, one of my buddies, Evan Engelhart, he, uh, him and I went to high school together. We re- rekindled after like 10 years of like not speaking at all. And uh, he invited me to come up in one of his planes. Like he drives like a little mini plane and it was so cool being able to see the prairies from above. But at the same time, like I was shitting my diaper the entire time because you're in this tiny rickety plane that's like bouncing all over the place and you're one mistake away from, you know, being done, right? Like if a car goes and breaks down, all right, car dies, side of the road, call CAA. If the plane goes down, you don't call CAA. You, you, know, you pray to Jesus. Like anybody got a candle back here? Like let's pray. <laughs> yeah, bro. Like that's, uh, that's, it's something I don't think about, you know what I mean? I fly a lot and I don't think about the planes going down, but like when you see that happens pretty close to you, caught, you know, hit you right in your backyard and canceled your tournament, it makes you think. It was a small plane, by the way. This We're not talking like an Air Canada, like 747. We're talking like a teeny weeny tiny, like small passenger plane coming from the Northwest Territories to the reserve. So uh, like, but what happened? When did you hear about the crash? We, we were literally preparing to go uh, Friday morning, like first thing bright and early, we were going to rock and roll. And then, you know, an hour into, you know, being up for the day, my buddy Keegan Prude and him and I were going to go down. He's like, dude, there's a plane crash. We, we're not going. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, the tournament's canceled because they're bringing the bodies back and the whole reserve is doing like a ceremony where they're canceling the tournament. So we couldn't play. Unfortunate, but also... Yeah, that's tough. That's tough, man. Uh, this trip here, being in downtown Edmonton, uh, I flew from uh, Vancouver to Edmonton. And I got to say, the Maple Leaf Lounge, it's starting to grow on me. The Vancouver one was very quiet, probably about 25 people in the lounge instead of 300 or 300 seats. They had a donut and a coffee bar for breakfast, which I was kind of impressed by, but uh, they had this. This is my favorite breakfast. If if any female that that I am uh, in the process of dating is listening to this, or anybody that really wants to like make my day, I love baked beans for breakfast. And I know it sounds kind of gross, but like hash browns with baked beans on top of like sausages and eggs is like one of the greatest breakfasts of all time. Steak and eggs is pretty great too, but like baked beans, they had baked beans, hash browns, eggs, and sausages for the Air Canada Maple Leaf Lounge buffet in Vancouver. My day was off to a great start. There was no losing after that point. Oh, what a great feeling when you walk into a lounge and you got a good breakfast spread and you get to just sit there and enjoy yourself, hey, man? Yeah, and there's not like 300 kids in there and like the dad with like the duck wings going to the pool. Like things were great. I, I really liked the Remember, remember the lounge we were in when we were, uh, what were we, Toronto on the halfway point from our train trip? And remember we were like, oh, yeah, we're going to go into the lounge. Let's go see what it's like. Remember we walk into the first class lounge and there were literally no seats available. It was standing room only in the lounge. We couldn't even barely get a water. <laughs> <laughs> dude yeah the via rail the the montreal business lounge everything was was taken and there was no hot food just drinks which was kind of sad but they ended up writing this it was like uh 30 gift cards to go get whatever we wanted in the station and I, and I think i ended up crushing like two pieces of cheesecake and a coffee at the second cup bake shop better be careful with all that cheesecake man you've been skating a lot you've been working out what's uh, what's going on over there with the workouts you staying in good shape you in game shape i'm putting on some calories I'm putting on some calories putting on a little bit of size pushing the weights trying to get some bigger shoulders but yeah I like to think I, Wait, I, I take. You're playing goalie, right? What's with the? What are you trying to put bigger shoulders? What are you thinking? Are you doing legs? Do you want, do you want leg to get into that? This actually, I think. Yeah, let's talk workouts. To, okay, so hear me out for a second. Uh, again, this is the Matt Murray influence. So, uh, Matt Murray is jacked, and he gives the illusion of being jacked. And I couldn't figure out what it was, but then I realized after a while, I was like, oh, his he has like really, really big shoulders. He's extremely wide. And then him and I were talking about that. Um, just like about putting on size because he went from, I want to say like 175, maybe 180 pounds when he was winning the Stanley Cups in Pittsburgh to now where he's like 220, 230. And he was saying like when you, like your entire life, you're training your lower body, like lower body, lower body, lower body, which is great because that's what goaltending is, a lot of single leg exercises. But the whole upper half of the chain, you're not doing anything for for the most part. So if you balance out the top with the bottom, everything works together in unison and in sync because the human body is just one giant chain. So if I can recruit stronger muscles from the upper body, it'll take away some of the compensate or some of the strain from the lower body. And I know that may not totally make sense, but everything is interconnected in one way or the other. And if you've ever done Chinese acupuncture, it's fantastic. Sometimes my guy in Winnipeg, he'll throw like a bunch of needles in my elbow and my knee, because like all the joints are, again, everything's one big chain. All the needles in my elbow will start stimulating like my knee. So I found this again coming from Matt, put on a little bit of size and a little bit of strength in the upper body, it balances out the whole chain. Like I've been doing lower body workouts my entire life. And now for the first time in my life, I'm trying to prioritize some upper body stuff and I guess balancing out the top half. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, you and I have talked a lot about this, Trav. Like my thing, my thing is for me, you got to be careful, especially as a hockey player, especially as a goalie, like your main power is coming from your legs. 
and you don't want to get too big and too bulky. And I found that personally for myself that like, uh, I want to be leaner and lighter as I move through the, into the future, into the world. I want to be more flexible. I want to be faster. Um, so I'm cognizant of that. I'm not thinking, you know, for myself, like I want to get too big, too bulky. I think, I see, I think it's harder to maintain that as you get older and like, you know, for me, I'm trying to stay healthy and like for you too, right? Like you want to have your career last as long as possible. And I think for that, the most important thing is agility, flexibility, obviously strength. Like you got to strengthen all the muscles and the tendons and everything, make sure it, but you want it to be balanced and you don't want to end up a top heavy goalie. Right. Um, but obviously you don't want to neglect your upper body strength as well. Obviously I get that. It was happy meaning between both. I just remember when I went to Sweden my first year, I went down like 205 pounds and it was the light, the leanest I've ever been since I became an adult. And I, and I just, even though I felt light, I felt frail and like weak, if that makes sense. Like I'm like very like, um, like not sturdy as opposed to now where like I'm 235 pounds and I feel better than I ever have been before. And then like, I feel like very sturdy and I'm just like one moving unit. Like I don't, I don't feel like a brick in the mud, if that makes sense. But I feel like everything is very balanced and very, um, just, I just feel better. Does that make sense? Well, that's great. I mean, that's the goal. The goal is to, you know, have your workouts make you feel amazing on the ice and, and so that you can perform at your craft. And that's really the main focus. Do you, you want to get into that lately? I know we had a couple other things and we're running a little bit tight on time, but do you actually want to get into the real reason uh, how Matt Murray changed my life and, and what kind of a friend he is? Yeah. How did, how did it happen? Okay. So when, when you see certain NHL players on TV, you see like lack of personality, just very like bland answers and the personality and the person that I've seen with Matt Murray and, and our friendship could not be anything different or anything further different from that. Um, I, I remember when, uh, when the Leafs came to Vancouver last year, him and I sat at the waterfront of Vancouver in March. We had an amazing like two, two and a half hour conversation just about life, politics, that type of stuff. And then fast forward to end of July, beginning of August, when you know, my ex-girlfriend and I split up. Uh, I was going through a really tough time, quite heartbroken to be quite honest with you. And I was talking to Matt about it and, and Matt was was uh, joking. He's like, well, man, you know, I locked it in early. I've had my wife, she's my high school sweetheart for a long time and I'm happy I don't gotta do, go through the stuff that you're going through. But I'll tell you this right now, I think a lot of the problems that you are experiencing in this moment are a result of not being the man that you could be. And I think that I should put you in touch with my life coach because he's gonna really train you to be the best man you can be. And that's what I found very helpful and very successful for himself, both with negotiating his new contract and just becoming the best man that he possibly can be. I said, okay, like, listen, like, I'm in, a, I'm in a spot where I'm willing to listen and I'm open-minded to anything and everything. And man, like, listening to Matt and, and working with TC Cummings the last six months just changed everything to just become authentically myself. I don't really care about all the outside forces and think about, like, what is, not in an overly selfish way, but, like, what is best for me? What is best for Travis? Well, do, do I want to be in a team in Watertown where maybe we don't treat our girlfriends the best we possibly could? No, I'm, I'm going to say something because that's authentically me. I'm not just going to sit here and enable that because... I, I know what being a real man is actually about, and that's not being a man. Am I uh, going to sit here and, and allow some woman to talk disrespectfully to me? No, I don't really have the patience for that, so I'm going to move forward with that. Am I going to allow all of these different forces in the outside world and the online and the internet to tell me what I should or shouldn't do in my career? Not really, because I don't really value those opinions. I don't even know these people. So sticking true authentically to myself, and that in itself is how Matt Murray changed my life to become to help me become the man that I really wanted to become and I, I couldn't be more happier with, with listening to him and, and our friendship. And I'm forever grateful and forever indebted to him for that. That's sick. And uh, I think it's important, again, like you've had the opportunity to put yourself in <clears throat> in communication with somebody who's at you know another level, you know, a Stanley Cup champion, NHL goaltender. And he's been willing to give you advice and time. And you've been willing to listen to that advice, you know, and actually not just like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But like you're actually taking actionable steps. Um, to see the things that he did to improve his life and then now putting that into your life and it's helping you as well. And that's awesome. That's a testament to, you know, what you're trying to build and like, you know, the relationships that you've cultivated as well. When we talked about this two episodes ago, surround yourself with winners because you become the environment you're in. If you're around winners, you're going to become a winner. If you're around losers, you're going to become a loser. And I would honestly say Matt Murray is probably the biggest winner that I have affiliation with in my life. And I'm not even just talking about like the guy's won two Stanley Cups and he's an NHL gold center who's recovering from double hip surgery right now. Just as a man, he's a winner. As a family man, he's a winner. Business-wise, which is something you'll obviously, I'm never going to share on this podcast, but business-wise, he's an absolute winner. He's a winner, he's a winner, he's a winner. My co-host on the other end of this call is a winner. I'm only affiliating with winners. I don't affiliate with losers. So having guys like Rob and having Matt in my life, man, game-changing. Game-changing. I couldn't be more thankful for the, for the both of you. All right, man. Same here.
Well, you know what? You know what I am really thankful for, and I think that you should listen to me about. What's that? The Manscaped Beard Hedger. The I second knew it. Sponsor I knew you were the going show. there. <laughs> <laughs> the Manscaped Beard Hedger. Uh, the show is sponsored by Manscaped, and the Beard Hedger is awesome. It has twenty different lengths for turning up your beard and fading and styling yourself, just like me. And it is waterproof as well. It has a sixty minute battery life, and those twenty different lengths. Oh, baby, skin fade right at the top of the uh, at the sideburns, and fade right into the beard to get the uh, the top G special, the top G Andrew Tate look, like I try to go for every time I polish up once a week. But you go to uh, manscaped.com, use the code biscuit b i z k i t for twenty percent off and free shipping only from the team of Manscaped. There's a link in the video description and a note or a link in the Apple Spotify podcasting notes. How's that for a quick ad? That's not too bad, bro. That's really good. A nice transition again, as always. Real pro. What do you think? Uh, have you seen? Have you been following any of the uh, NFL playoff games? And uh, what do you think about it? You think the NFL's rigged to try to get uh, Kelsey and Taylor Swift into the Super Bowl? Oh, uh, dude, I can't stand Taylor Swift. Do you, do, do you even want to talk about that? I really don't want to talk about that. I'm just kind of tired of it, to be honest with you. Like she's everywhere. Like she, like when I found out that she sued some guy for one dollar just to prove a point, I was like. I'm, I'm, done. This. Like, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. She sued this guy for one dollar just to prove a point. So, I'm so that mean I'm assuming you're not going to be watching the Super Bowl because it's going to be basically the Taylor Swift part, uh, the Taylor Swift show part two. Man, I wanted the Detroit Lions to win so bad. Like when Eminem was flipping off, oh, I was pulling for the Bills, fans. man. The, the, the Bills, they broke, they broke the, the, the Taylor Swift in Buffalo, basically ripping the heart out of the Buffalonians last week. I know for the three point win and uh, oh man, I know it's tough. It's insufferable. Can you imagine a, a Detroit Lions Buffalo Bills final? What what uh, final that would have been? That would have been amazing. Sort of the the Chiefs and the Forty uh, ers I wish Jimmy G was behind the in the pocket. The oh 49ers. yeah, I know your boy Jimmy G. Where is Jimmy G these days anyway? I don't know. I think he's in Oakland. I think he's or no for the Vegas Raiders playing at the uh, the Death Star. They call the arena because just a big yeah. Black I forgot box. he was your uh, he was like your man crush that guy. Dude, he was my phone screensaver for like two years. He's so good looking. He's got that jawline. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy G, baby, Jimmy Garoppolo, baby. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? Right. Um, I did go to the Oilers Blackhawks game the other day, though. By the way. Oh yeah, what was that like? That. I went to the I saw the Blackhawks in Buffalo a couple like a couple weeks ago, I guess. How was the game? It's it's weird because, and I know some people are really not going to like this. It's a bit of a hot take. I hate watching NHL hockey for the reason of I don't want to watch. I want to do right. Like, like this isn't exciting. Like me sitting in a seat all night, you know, eating popcorn, having my chicken wings, having some fries. I go get some poutine for twenty five bucks. It's overpriced. I just spent fourteen dollars on parking. I'm sitting here. I got some guy punch, like pinching my elbows, and I'm not comfortable. And I got to watch the game. That's not fun. That's not entertaining. Like, I want to be on the ice doing, not watching. So, and and there is definitely a degree of jealousy. I'm very jealous because those guys are doing what I wish I was doing. And I understand I'm never going to play in the NHL. That ship sailed a very very long time ago. But just the idea of they're playing professional hockey. I'm sitting here watching. I don't like this. I want to play, even if it's in the Fed for 150 or for well, maybe not the Fed anymore for reasons we'll talk about on the Patreon untold episodes and the exclusive stories of my time in the FPHL. But I want to play professional hockey. I don't want to watch it. It's just it's it's not exciting for me. Maybe that'll change over time. Yeah, I was gonna say like, do you think you'll ever get past that and like be able to just enjoy the game, or you just think uh, right now in the stage of life that you're in, it's not going to be uh, something you can enjoy? I've heard lots of guys talk about how like they just completely rid themselves in the game once they're done, and I don't know if I'm. I done think or that's not, really common. Wondering. I think that's really common. I know a lot of my friends that are just like done with hockey after like a lot of my friends when I played pro. Like as soon as they were done, I remember my one boy. As he, I remember as soon as he was done, I remember him watching, taking his hockey bag and throwing it. There was a dumpster. They were doing a renovation at our house, and and I think it was when I was in Reading, and he he's like, I'm done with the game. He literally took his whole hockey bag and threw it in the dumpster, and that was it. He was done playing and like just not part of the game anymore. I think that's a real like common thing. Sean Avery got cut from the Rangers. He literally, after the like when the game was done, took his gear out of the out of MSG, went and threw it all in the Hudson River. <laughs> oh, did he really? Yeah, yeah. He literally took all of his stuff. Was like, I'm done. Don't even need this. Threw the bag, oh skates, gosh. everything in the river. I mean, I went through that similar thing in my life too, where I was like, oh man, I don't want to be. In, I don't want to go watch hockey. I, I don't want to follow the NHL. Uh, like, if I'm not going to play in it, I don't want to be a part of it. Um, but that's actually, you know, I'm I'm in a similar place now where like. Now with with butt ends, like where it's it's, it's giving me something to really look forward to with hockey, you know, because I get to go and see players using butt ends grips and that gives me joy and like gives me a whole reason to really be a part of the game and to follow it. Um, but I find that like if I don't have guys on the ice that are using butt ends, I'm like not as into it, you know what I'm saying, as like a as just a casual fan. But um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to get to go and see players at all levels, but obviously even in the NHL. Uh, you know, using the product. So it makes me like stay kind of into the action a little bit more. You know what I mean? You know, it's, it kind of sounds like they talk about like when you gamble on hockey. Now, I've never gambled before in my life, but when you're gambling on the game, you're more invested. So you're going to watch more. 
which is why the NHL, the NFL, the NBA, and the Major League Baseball, they want you gambling because you put 20 bucks on a game. You're like, I want to win that $400 bet on my 20 bucks. You know what I mean? But, and you're using butt ends. I want to see the player using butt ends. It sounds kind of like a gambling addiction to an extent. Yeah, I mean, like I feel well. It feels exciting for me. I'm I'm invested though. I love it. Like when I'm play, like when I'm watching my guys play, like that are using butt ends. Like I'm I'm excited, and I'm like you know I'm like heartbroken if they don't win or if they don't play well or if they don't succeed. So for me, it's fun. But uh, yeah, it's definitely different than like laying down a bet or doing something like that, which I think is kind of crazy though. The way that like all the sports leagues now are just like put you know pushing gambling and uh, just to get people involved. I think it's kind of crazy. It's insane, man. I I remember when we hammered out this deal, the Nation Network. The two things I said, I said. We're not going to do gambling ads. We're not going to do booze ads because it's not authentic. It's not genuine. Coming back to the talk about Matt. And also, like, any kids or any parents watching, like, how could you actually take this podcast and anything I say seriously if I say, boy, the wing guys, this podcast is sponsored by some gambling website, so go blow your money and be a degenerate, right? Or, or why don't you drink this new cell? Like, I, I don't even drink. I haven't had alcohol. We, ha- we collectively, you and I, haven't had alcohol in our bodies in, like, five, six plus years. So it's not genuine. It just it makes me shake my head. Yeah, I'm glad about that, man. That's cool. Uh, taking the high road because I think a lot of people are. There's a lot of money being made, like you know, pushing that, you know, and uh, it can be that can be, you know, gambling can be one of the worst addictions you can have. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it can ruin your life very, very quickly. So you got to be careful. It's not just like oh, I'll place a bet on a team. Like you got to be careful with that. It's like uh, when you eat like Pringles chips. It doesn't just stop at one. You can't just eat one chip. You're gonna eat the whole thing, right? Eventually. Well, here's a question for you. Do you have any butt ends, guys, on uh, on the Oilers? Yeah, we got uh, Derek Ryan's been using our stuff for a couple of years now. Um, he's a great player who's actually a great guy to look up to also, who really like earned his way to the NHL. He was one of those players who wasn't like a guaranteed player. And he's he went out, I think he was playing over in Europe, uh, you know, as like kind of like buried over in Europe and was able to grind his way and get a spot. And not only get a spot, but he's earned multiple contracts with the Oilers. And he's, you know, carved out a nice little role, little role there. Uh, and he's been using butt ends for a few years. Uh, and I think also, I'm not sure if he's still in them, but I know Gagne was also in, in them for a while. And uh, my old equipment manager, when I played for the Toronto Marlies in the American League, my boy Harry was our equipment manager then. He's now the equipment manager for the Oilers. And so we still have a pretty good relationship and he'll call me up and like kind of shoot the breeze a bit and uh, place orders for the guys. And it's uh, cool to have a nice connection with the Oilers and to see them having this success. I'm excited for their run. Yeah, almost 17 minutes. You know who I saw in the elevator the other day? Who's that? So, so I'm at the JW Marriott in uh, downtown Edmonton, in Ice District, and I go to hop in the elevator the other day. You will not believe who was in the elevator when I got in. Who? Corey Perry. No, wow, the new guy in town. Dude, I'm literally, um, I'm waiting in the on the 18th floor. Elevator opens. I'm assuming he's staying at the J-Dub Marriott on the 20th or 21st, whatever, like one of the higher suite floors because the, the, they're partners with the, the Oilers. And I come in and I, I make eye contact with him and I instantly could sense he was like not interested in sharing the elevator with anybody. And I was like, I'm, I don't care what you've done, man. Like, I, I really don't. Like, I just, like, honestly, like, I wanted to say like, bro, I don't even care about the Oilers. I don't even care about the NHL. I don't care, like you got a nice watch on, dude. You know what I mean? Like that's what I what my, my mindset went. And so we're in that elevator. We're going from the 18th floor, probably around like the 12th or the 11th floor hits. And I looked down and he had like a really nice pair of shoes on. And I wanted to compliment his watch, but I, my, my eyes went to the shoes and I said, hey man, you got some really nice shoes. And he kind of looked at me like, I, I think he was anticipating me saying something about Bedard's mom. And he's probably he's like, like, I just want to get out of here so bad. I can get out of this elevator right now. Because, like, I thought for, like, six floors, I was going to ask him something about the shoes or the watch, and I think he could sense that, but I think he thought I was going to ask about Bedard's mom, but to be honest, I don't really care. And so I was like, hey, man, nice shoes. And he's like, <laughs> oh, yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate that. And I was like, yeah, they're sleek. They're really clean. And he got it out of the elevator, and that was it. That was my uh, 15 like, seconds with Corey Perry. compliment sufficient. Thanks. <laughs> like, hey, man, thanks for not mentioning my my last employer. That's I really appreciate that. That kind of made my day. Yeah, that whole thing is crazy, but, uh, you know, I mean, that's a pretty, he's a pretty solid veteran player that could really uh, be helping the Oilers down the stretch here. And, like, they're they're just on a tear, hey? You think that made his day? The fact that, that I asked about it, I told him. That you told him about good. his shoes? Yeah, that his shoes look good. You think that made his day? Yeah, I'm sure he's probably happy he got a compliment. You think he probably went Why to the link and was like, who was that nerd? He's probably like, ah, I'm, looking, I'm looking fresh. Trev like, my Oilers shoes? Complimented my shoes. It's like, God. Shoes haven't been clean in like six months, but God, that dweeb in the elevator still looked nice. Yeah, I guess this watch is pretty nice too. <laughs> yeah, no biggie. And so I've been staying at the, the JW Marriott the, the past couple nights, and what a place. I know you're a tried and true Marriott Bonvoy advocate, right? Yeah, I grind on the Bonvoy. Um, yeah, I sure do. I'm an ambassador elite. <laughs> <laughs> what, what does that mean? You're an elite member. 
Uh, well, they're, it's I mean they're you know they're program or I don't even know what they call it, but uh, you know when you stay there you get points and you know you're trying to like whenever you stay there you you get a certain amount of points and I actually do, I put everything toward airline miles so that you know you can travel and do everything like and you know with work with butt ends traveling the world I, sometimes I end up staying in hotels and it, I just got juiced into the to the, the rewards program with the Bonvoy and that's uh, that's where we like to stay mostly it's pretty convenient you know I'll be traveling and I'll be like oh I'm like tired I need to pull over and sleep and boom find a Bonvoy bing you're in and then you know you walk in and like oh thank you for being an ambassador elite thank you for your loyalty and like here's your welcome gift yeah, that's kind of nice like, thank you very much, Mr. Lalonde. It's Lalonde. Here's your compliment. Yeah, that's perfect. Drink. Nice, nice pronunciation. No, but yeah, you do get like it's. It's funny how each tier you go up, you start to get a little bit more, uh, a little bit more uh, white glove treatment from the from the employees there. It's funny because when we, when I first started traveling a lot, I would like book on Priceline, you know, or like the you know the discount apps to try to find like Expedia like, or Trivago, yeah, yeah. And you show up with a price. If you show up with like a Priceline or an Expedia reservation, they kind of like oh. The people that work there are like, oh, they like they make you sit there at the desk while they like go through the computer for fifteen minutes, and then all of a sudden you start to become like, you know, you get status with their with their reward program, and they show up and they hand you gifts and they give you upgrades to suites and like it just changes the whole game. And I gotta say though, like I've never stayed at a Marriott before, the J Dub and Ice District in downtown Edmonton. What an experience rolling out the red carpet. They have incredible lounges. The executive lounge, I think, or, or is it the executive lounge that they call it upstairs, Rob? Um, I think it's the Ambassador Lounge. Ambassador Lounge, know. excuse me. The Ambassador Lounge, incredible. The breakfasts they do, like just this morning, they had like an egg white omelet with mushroom cheddar and spinach. They got sausages. They got scrambled eggs, bacon. They got like yogurt parfaits, drip coffee, espresso machine, dinner time. They had the most amazing tofu stir fry ever last night. I asked the chef. The chef comes out. I said, chef, this is the best tofu I've ever had in my life. What is the secret? He says, flour flour dredge, deep fried, sauteed in the sauce with the veggies and the noodles. I was like, chef, you deserve a raise. This is the best buffet, buffet I've ever been to that. The cheesecake was great. The desserts are great. Everything is great. I love the executive lounge, the uh, ambassador lounge at Marriott. And uh, the second tallest building in the city of Edmonton, incredible. Uh, Really, really fantastic. I will say uh, the Fairmont Grand Railway hotels are pretty sexy too, like the Hotel McDonald, the Hotel Vancouver. I don't know who I want to get in bed with points-wise, whether I want to do Fairmont or Bonvoy, but man, you can't go wrong with either or. Yeah, Bonvoy's everywhere, man. So if you uh, if you get there, you're going to be able to find a place to stay no matter where you're traveling. So, But uh, I do want to give a quick shout-out as we uh, wrap up here to uh, Theo Tomlin and uh, Max Quain. They're uh, Patreon members. They're uh, over there in Ottawa. I want to give a shout-out to you guys. Uh, and Sling of the Biscuit, we do new episodes every single Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern. That's uh, 10 in Winnipeg, 9 here in downtown Edmonton in the uh, foothills of, of Alberta, 8 a.m. on the Pacific Northwest where I live currently in uh, downtown Vancouver. This is Rob Lalonde. My Rob Lalonde, my beautiful, good-looking co-host in Buffalo, New York. I'm Travis Bridgen, your unemployed professional hockey goalie, former FPHL pro. And uh, we look forward to seeing you for the next episode of Sling the Biscuit next Sunday on YouTube, Apple, or Spotify. We'll see you then. Thanks a lot, guys. Later.